So good morning, everyone, and welcome to our uh, bi-monthly East Side Regional Action Plan meeting. Um, I am Landon. I'm the operations manager with SB Act, and I want to introduce my newest colleague, Kai, if you want to unmute yourself and just introduce yourself for a second. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Kai Tilly. I'm the newest member of SB Act. I started last week. And I am the program administrator, so just sort of working on admin and assisting other collaboratives, things like that. Um, so I'm sort of moving into Landon's job, and Landon is moving into Catherine's job, if you um, know Catherine. And um, just a little bit about my background. I just graduated with a master's in counseling at Pacifica Graduate Institute. And um, so that's sort of, I'm sort of from the mental health um, realm, and I'm just very excited to be kind of um, a part of helping out homelessness here in Santa Barbara County. And I am local to the area. I grew up in Santa Maria and then um, my parents grew up in Santa Barbara and then I've been here for the last decade and I'm just very passionate about um, the area. So thank you for having me. Thanks Kai. We're really excited to have a little bit more of a behavioral health lens on the team with us. So. Uh, just a couple general announcements before we get started. So today is going to be our quarterly uh, presentation from PATH as a part of their conditional use permit. So we have Jonathan here with us for that presentation. Um, so we may run a little longer than our usual half hour uh, open meeting time. And then um, I also just wanted to remind everybody we have our all call wrap meeting on Tuesday of next week. Um, we rescheduled that. So it'll be Tuesday, the 23rd at noon. Um, on Zoom, and I can put the link in the chat window for that. But we will be uh, hearing a presentation from the county department or, or the county continuum of care about our point in time count from 2023 and just a deeper dive into those numbers and trends that we're seeing around who is entering homelessness and what numbers have decreased over the last year. So, so we hope you can join us Tuesday at noon. Um, and then the last thing before we go to PATH is that there have been um, several different cleanups initiated along the Highway 101 corridor over this month, um, first by Caltrans uh, at the beginning of May, and then just this starting this last week uh, by the Union Pacific Railroad, because they have those properties that are immediately adjacent to the freeway. So uh, if I can ask CityNet to maybe just share a quick update about how that's going and any movement that you've been seeing, that would be great. Yes, so um, I've actually been with them all this week. Um, so it was good to get out there and do some outreach during a, a time of um, something new going on here in uh, Santa Barbara. Um, so we start off in, in Goleta and we're working our way. So just an update for the, um, the east side and just Santa Barbara. So um, I know yesterday, um, Officer Potter, who's one of the agents that um, works on this um, for UPR and is going through the process, is kind of we set up the areas um, that have been of concern um, off the railroad tracks. I know we connected with Joelle um, and I've been in, in communication with, with everyone that's in the area. So today is actually, I know they were out in Montecito on those portions of the tracks to kind of get a, a, a lay of the land in that area. But um. There's four, four specific areas that we'll be um, hitting on, I would say, starting around the Modoc area, Mission Creek, um, Mission, and then like Las Positas, um, going towards the Amtrak, and that'll be working its way towards the east side. Um, it's definitely new um, because one thing that we do, you know, they've always been used to kind of like a very much aware of the 72-hour notice, anything like that. They did do postings over a month ago, so it was a while ago, and I know it's something that's been pushed back um, for a, a time frame um, where they're now actually, you know, doing the clearings. So a lot of individuals were, you know, um, struggling with the fact that they wasn't as clear to them of it being, you know, cleared, even though our outreach team has been out throughout the area in Santa Barbara County, just notifying them that, hey, this is going on, this is going to come up. We're not sure how the process was going to work. Um but being there with the process, uh, it it's going well so far. I'm very thankful for that. Um, myself, along with one of the other um, staff members that's a case management for that specific contract, we're there um, because I'm familiar with many of the individuals, but most of our staff is very familiar. Um, we were able to just get, um, so far right now, we've been able to get four people into shelter. Um, 
we have hopefully one possibly going in on Monday. Um, and it's been Hedges House of Hope. So we want to I want to thank Susanna. But I don't think she's on the call. Um, it was Hedges House of Hope, you know, um, just everyone just coming together, you know, rescue mission. Um, we've got someone and then we have, you know, obviously our path beds. So we're always thankful for that collaboration. We've had uh, multiple people in there and then the clearing. So they go, they give them, uh, you know, not too much of a time to get cleared. And then they just go and clear the whole encampment. So it's, you know, it's a tough situation where one, when I was there, I was looking at it, I understood they have to do the job um, and they're doing a good job at that. From the other standpoint, as the, you know, with the case managers and outreach teams and what we do, it's difficult definitely to see, you know, the individuals lose, I would say, 95 percent or more of their belongings. But what I was explaining to them as they were going through that and when I even talked to the agents and the workers doing the work and even to my staff. And so now just saying it to the community, um, these are obviously tough situations, can, can be sometimes trauma, traumatizing to the individuals going through it. But multiple times that we've gotten these individuals now into shelter, one of the first questions that we get from shelter say, hey, I'll just make sure, you know, the amount of belongings they're able to have is usually like a, a, you know, everyone's familiar with the black bins with the yellow lids, so to speak. So it's, you know, they can bring in about two of those bins max, you know, is what they're able to bring in. And so with these clearings, that's kind of what they were really left with, you know. Um, so on their part, it's, it's very, you know, it's sad and it's, it's a difficult situation, but it's a hurdle that many times our outreach and these individuals go through because they get so attached and connected to the amount of belongings that they have. And so when those opportunities to go into shelter come, they don't want to leave their belongings. They're so attached to them. So they decide not to go to shelter or the amount of belongings they're bringing in. It's just not acceptable at the shelters, you know, with the space that's available for all the shelters. So that was the thing I was explaining to everyone. And it, and we saw it. I got to see with my own eyes where it was like a couple individuals previously that weren't going to shelter were now able to go to shelter or, you know, did go to shelter because of the fact the amount of belongings they had left with them. And it worked, you know, I went to Hedges myself and, I, you know, we were, our staff was taking people to the shelters um, and I saw the process. So it was tough, but there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And the big picture is permanent housing, right? Um, being at a property that I managed, you know, all permanent housing for 61 individuals that were previously unhoused. As the property manager here, one thing I've realized through these couple of years being here is a difficulty of either one, they start building up, um, you know, start hoarding, so to speak, and can't pass inspection. You know, it's one of the biggest things that I've had to work with, you know, tenants here. So seeing this process, explain to them, that's your goal. That's where we want you to be. And yes, this is a tough time right now, but it's now helping you get into the shelter with no hurdles besides, you know, just the things that you go through on your own. So um, it was, like I said, it, it, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a good thing for the community. It's a tough thing for the individuals and even for our outreach workers. Um, but the larger picture it is something that, you know, at times where it got to this point, it's necessary. And as you guys will see, if you guys are driving down the 101 um, today, Caltrans has been doing their side and they're working hand in hand with UPR. They're still trying to clean up some areas in that side. But UPR is over here doing their part and they're cleaning up the house. I have to say that they really are. Um, and so they'll be out here. And we've talked about future um, opportunities and how this will work. And then th that's something we can definitely talk about later on because uh, um, at times it is necessary. Um, and so you guys will be seeing some larger encampments that you've probably been aware of um, will probably be cleared up if they're on the railroad tracks. Thank you, Al. So as we mentioned, this has uh, really been a big initiative throughout this month. And so we do anticipate we're going to see a lot of movement. Hopefully a lot of these individuals will be moving into shelters like Al was talking about, but we know that some will likely not. And so we may see some movement throughout our community. Um, so as always, it's helpful if you can report encampments just so we know where the services can be directed um, because a lot of individuals are are being displaced in the process. And we're kind of at the mercy of Caltrans and UPRR in these processes. Um, these are large statewide organizations, so they don't operate on our city calendars by any means. Um, so if they choose to do a cleanup in the month of May, then then we have to 
kind of just figure out how to work around them. Uh, so if you have any questions about that, please feel free to raise them. I see Jonathan has his hand up. Yeah, I was I was just kind of thinking, and this this question is not actually um, for any one particular person, but just more of a of a thought for for us to maybe elevate in different spaces or think about as a community. I know that, and and if this is something that's already been looked at, I apologize, but I, I know in a lot of communities that work with um, have larger populations of encampments that there are um storage programs that they've invested into um that allow for folks who live in encampments or folks who have more belongings um for them to have a safe space to store their belongings while kind of working on on their their housing plan um and so just you know wanted to share that with with the group and and i, I think that there's opportunity there um you know for those um um for those uh, type of programs collaborating um with business partners as well because i know that um you know we, we actually are, are getting uh, a program off the ground in, in san jose it's a storage program um and we're working with with an existing property and kind of putting modular um storage units on there and so just kind of thinking through that as as a as a potential solution or opportunity that maybe we can explore as a community and in and, and all and maybe in a different sort of uh, space but just wanted to add that comment because that could help address some of the barriers that Al was speaking to around um you know the mass amount of belongings that folks have in encampments yeah and my apologies actually and thank you Jonathan for pointing that out is that yeah so during that time um the county and and like I said we have storage so for many of those because they're on the UPR and that's essentially our surf contract that we have we do have storage for that so we were offering much storage to that and another thing with Jonathan bringing that up it's great because that's something we've been asking for for many years you know for that and I know the city of Santa Barbara is actually in the process of working on something like that with us um, to be able to provide that because it's definitely a concern um, and thank you Jonathan for reminding me of that. Yeah, I think, Barbara, if you want to share the updates from the city about storage, we do have some progress in that front. Yeah, and, and Al is right. So we actually were communicating with our county partners about the storage access that they provide as um, for individuals living in encampments um, and how that's utilized and how well the kind of that, that's being facilitated um, to learn from them as we step into providing um, something similar for our unsheltered population just throughout the city. Um, and so I think we're dipping our toe, Jonathan, into that process to have this be kind of managed through case management with CityNet initially, you know, if that's utilized in the way that we are hoping that it's utilized and that we can provide an option for people to say yes to, to shelter because we have a storage option for them um, and it's received well. And again, we're seeing those kind of visible impacts and improvements. I, I do hope that we can start the conversation about um, more storage solutions that can be accessed by individuals experiencing homelessness and doesn't necessarily have to go through a, a case management process. But I think for us, we're we're hoping to incentivize people to, to say yes and be open to that um, and then offer those alternatives so that they can say yes to other opportunities, especially shelter. Thank you all. Any other questions? I do see Natasha's comment in the chat. I completely agree. And we have some individuals with significant um, uh, behavioral health challenges that contribute to them not wanting to uh, put their individuals in storage as well. So there's there's other layers to this. Yeah. And Al is right. Like we we have a number of individuals, you know, that are housed in the city of Santa Barbara that now have you know been raised to that level. Um, that hoarding is impacting their ability to be able to for for um, EMTs and fire to be able to access what they need to access in case there's a threat for for life and safety. Um, exit, ingress, ingress, egress. Wow, I, I want to make it that get that correct, but like those pathways, like it comes to you know a different level of the city team um, when we see that that hoarding has reached um, you know again and and impacted our ability to be able to to provide proper safety um, and for the neighbors to be able to do that. So I you know I hope that Al, you bringing this up and the encampment work that's happening and then the interim housing units that are coming on board to help specifically individuals that have been residing in encampments that we we look at the behavioral health aspects of um you know hoarding items and obviously understanding that 
um, the emotional value of that in those belongings too is, is super sensitive. And so we want to make sure that um, our approach is with the team in terms of empathy and compassion first, and also trying to get them to manage belongings so that they do have access to these opportunities down the road. Um, so yeah, it's, I appreciate the conversation around it too. And I think in the coming months, as we figure out our storage program, that we want to have more dialogue around this as well. Yeah, that's that's very that's very important and a perfect way to put it, Barbara. It's just because at the end of the day, like I was saying, when they get housed, it's it goes exactly what you were talking about. I have to make sure when we do the inspections that there's three feet from the windows, from the door. Exactly. So if AM armor, so it's not just the beginning process on the streets, but it's the goal at the end was when they're housed. The, this process doesn't stop. So preparing them in, in the most humane you know, with the most love and empathy throughout the process and understanding where they're at and meeting them there is uh, is huge. Well, thank you for that update and for the ongoing conversation about this. Um, I want to move us on just so we have enough time for our PATH presentation. So, Jonathan, I've made you a co-host. i push it over to you. Thank you. Give me a second to share my screen. It always takes me a second to adapt sharing my screen from Teams to Zoom because our organization uses Teams. So I'm on that 95% of the time. So um, the struggle is real. I keep meeting these people who are used to Teams over Zoom, and I I don't understand you. I I can't figure out how to share in Teams yet. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm the opposite. Yeah. They're both pretty bad. There we go. Well, Zoom makes it so so obvious that it makes it difficult because it had the shared the shared screen already highlighted, and I and I was missing it. So um, we're looking everywhere except for what was highlighted. Thumbs up, you can see see the screen. Okay, wonderful. Um, so um, we we have some some um, items that we wanted to follow um, to follow up on from the previous conversation from from last week. There, we're going to be talking a little bit about. We're going to provide some outreach updates to you as well as um, you know some some other efforts that are go going on. In terms of our coordinated outreach efforts, we wanted to share that that Odin is uh, continuously collaborating and working with with all of our various partners on on this call, and and even expanding the way that that we're doing outreach. Um, I know that that during the last um, time that we had presented and a few weeks ago or a few meetings ago, that there was a lot of um, conversation around vehicular homelessness and what that's looking like, and um, you know Odin has been adjusting his uh, outreach hours to um, um, to try to catch folks because um, he was sharing that that it was very difficult during during the day um, to engage with folks at their vehicle that they weren't there and so adjusting the hours to make sure that we can catch them sort of you know in, in odd hours and unfortunately we we've been still having some challenges around engaging folks but regardless we've noticed that there has been um, a decrease since the past month with with vehicles in the area. Um, as well. Um, you know, Odin is, has also been doing a wonderful job of expanding partnerships with B, uh, with Be Well. Uh, he's been working with their team to connect them to um, uh, behavioral health services. So we're really excited to share that three individuals have been connected to services, which is huge. I think as the group were, was sharing earlier, that um, a lot of our folks have mental health needs, whether it's SMI or, or, or something else, you know, um, less severe, but is persistent and impacts their ability to, to navigate the system. Um, and our systems are difficult to navigate, you know, and so being able to, to make those connections is really exciting to see. As well as um, we've started um, sending referrals to our, our SendCal providers. And so for those who are, um, I'm sorry, um, to SendCal. And, and so for, the, for those of you who are, um, you know, familiar or not familiar with SendCal, it's it's um, a health plan, and they're getting uh, they're moving more into the space around collaborating with with homeless service providers um, in a number of ways, and so we're excited that 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 partnership is is beginning to grow um, with Odin's outreach efforts. 
In terms of community efforts, um, I already touched up on this a little bit, but we wanted to, to share what we were observing in our community because there's also been an uptick in um, uh, our some of our, par our our business neighbors reaching out, sharing that that there's been an uptick in, in people and new faces that they're seeing. And, and, and what we um, have been noticing as we've been um, seeing folks who are new in the area is that the 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 correlation appears to be from from the cleanups that are happening from Union Union Pacific Railroad, and so we just felt like it was something to kind of important in, in highlighting because you know um, I think it's important for our business neighbors to know um, what what are the ebbs and flows and what's happening in our community when we're kind of seeing an an, an uptick that's that's sort of going on. Um, one thing that I also just wanted to mention that that keeps kind of coming to my mind is as um, you know Union Pacific Railroad and Caltrans continues to kind of clean up their, their parts of the property is, I just don't want anyone to also forget that Caltrans has invested in, in um, uh, homeless solutions and other communities as well. And so as, as these are kind of happening, even, you know, if there's ways that, that even with our business partners here that we can collaborate to say that we want to see the same and something similar in our community as well, because it has an impact on our, on our communities. So just kind of wanted to note that. The other thing that that um, has come up is, um, or that came up in the last meeting, was um, an observation around the increase of, of litter that's been going on in front of the PATH building and, and within the general neighborhood. Um, and so um, I'm actually going to, um, we, we've been working and coordinating with um, the city on this, and, and so the city um, we'll provide some some updates there um, just after um, after I, I kind of go through the rest of the presentation, but just wanted to share that that's something that we we took back and 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 looked at and and saw a correlation with the increase in, in litter occurring after um, one of the the city trash cans was removed from the front of our building. So there, there's an update that the city will provide after the presentation or around that that we're hoping will will resolve some of the observations that all of you made. Um, and then Odin, do you want to share about the, the awesome success stories that, that we got? Gladly. Yeah. So we've managed to get, um, three people permanently housed in the past month with 18 individuals housed since, uh, March 1st, three of them being directly associated with outreach. And I'm going to use some aliases to avoid breaching HIPAA, but one of our clients, Amy, we'll call her, was homeless since 2019, barely, uh, visually impaired and movement impaired, a lot of run-ins with the law and just very much down on her luck. We managed to, uh, after connecting with CityNet Behavioral Wellness and having uh, all these service providers, you know, coming together, getting her into PATH, after a long struggle of finding a place that could, you know, not only house her, but house her, um, a, her uh, caregiver, because clearly she couldn't, uh, you know, live on her own. We recognized that we need, that she needed some kind of support system there and that came in with uh with family so we managed to get her into uh some housing and city that definitely is very familiar with this individual and now they're uh they're finally housed another individual dan came up to me after 20 years of living in his car on the waterfront he was diagnosed uh with stage three cancer of the colon came up into uh to me after a referral from his nurse and said hey odin didn't expect to ever come over to here. In fact, I never wanted to walk into a shelter ever, but I need some help. So with my recommendation, I told him, hey, let's get you into a medical bed. We talked to the nurses, got him into the recuperative care program here at PATH. Uh, after seeing uh, connected with multiple nurses, he transitioned out into transitional housing, uh, which was a shared living over there. But I still managed, but even though he was housed there, I still recognized that he needed that kind of support. So I carried his hand, held his hand all the way until uh, we referred him to both Good Samaritan for uh, wraparound care services and to the to the housing authority to get him a housing voucher. So after like two months there, looking around for apartments anywhere and everywhere that could take him take him on. We managed to snag a place over in Goleta. And uh, now he's getting all the services that he needs uh, with through Good Samaritan case management plus a nurse plus a nurse plus a uh, housing voucher plus SSI. So now he can pay for not only his rent, not only his rent, his necessities, and he has that uh, that supportive care that he desperately needed. 
and one other individual, one other individual that we're all very familiar. Joao's familiar, and I believe Natalia is also very familiar because we also have a, uh, as I, you have a picture of me and him on the 101. Very, very high needs individual, very, very, um, uh, but also very driven individual. Uh, we had multiple interactions before he would make encampments, you know, make a mess of the place and then move on. And then it would just be a back and forth between him and Joao and the other waste management teams to just try and move him along. But he was always, always very cooperative with us and just moving things along. Uh, moving things along. We'll call him Randy. He's, uh, after getting in contact with him, we understand, we understood that honestly, he, he wasn't open for places like living on his own. He, we couldn't re, he recognized that, hey, if I'm left to my own devices, I don't feel like I'd be comfortable. So we said, hey, okay, let's get you some more supportive services. Let's get you some income that you can, so you can pay for that. And let's go ahead and get you, uh, in a place of, you know, a place where you have like a support system around you. So we uh, managed to get him into one of the affording affordable housing projects with case ma supportive case management from Good Samaritan uh, to just really touch base. And now he's working not only to get SSI, but also get clean and sober. And it's kind of a an amazing thing because he's been homeless since 1995 on the streets and never had his own place to be. And after so many years of being... Uh, I think he was originally from up north and then coming all the way down this way is he finally managed to get into his forever home. So that uh, just three massive success stories for three individuals with very high needs on the east side finally go to home. So pass it back to uh, Jonathan. Thank you, Odin. And and the reason why I, I really appreciated the, the stories for, for two of the individuals in particular is they had been on the streets for for 20 plus years and you know there's there's this perception that some people just don't want help and you know as an organization we don't believe that people choose to be homeless we just haven't figured out the right way of sort of engaging with them and so through this sort of outreach model that that uh, Odin is exemplifying and the outreach model that other of our partners are doing here that with persistent and frequent engagement that we can have success with everyone so um Lastly, I just wanted to share, um, oh, and then just also wanted to note that the 18 permanent housing placements that we've had since March 1st has been in collaboration with with all of our, um, with all of the PATH programs in, in, um, in our building. And then lastly, a community cleanup. You all know that we have a community cleanup that goes on, um, and we have one coming up this Saturday, actually, from 9 to 12. And we were asking for anybody here that is interested in participating this Saturday in particular, please join us because some one of our our, our group of volunteers who, who regularly helps out um, at the last minute realized that they weren't going to be able to do it. There's there's some sort of conflict that's going on. So we're in need of, of more volunteers. And so if you are interested, we've created a um, SB volunteers at epath.org email to make it really simple for folks um, um, who are interested in, in getting involved with, with us, um, whether it's community cleanups or, or supporting and, and serving food in the kitchen, that you can all, you can do that. Um, so I can take questions now if there's enough time, Landon, otherwise that concludes the, the presentation. Yes, we do have some time. Hi, Jonathan and Susie from Marboard. Thank you for your presentation. And Odin, I just want to commend you for your good work. I see you every day out there. And I know you've made connections with our safety department as well. Um, Jonathan, with regards to the decrease in vehicles, um, we've we've actually seen the same cast of characters that are in their vehicles that appear to be um probably running some inappropriate activities out of their cars, that especially I'm sure you're familiar with the van with several bikes on top and so forth. Um, I, I definitely know that there's some drug activity, activity going in and out of there. Um, I'm, I just wanted to know how you validated the, the decrease in cars because we're actually seeing the opposite, so. Yeah. Yeah, it's go ahead, Odin. 
I can speak on that. So um, with regard to the decrease in cars, we're seeing less cars specifically in the underpasses. Although we do see individuals here living in their cars right up front, I did touch base with a few of them, especially the one that we're both familiar with right in the, with the, the, the uh, bicycles up top. And what the barrier right now that I'm seeing with him is that he, there's not a good place for him to park during the daytime because with new beginnings, they have a safe parking program, but it only covers during the nighttime. And he's saying that, hey, there's no bathrooms, there's this place over here. And I said, hey, there are other places to park. Let's go ahead and walk in. Uh, so far right now, just kind of encouraging him to move, move along. There's still a little bit of that rapport building. We're still in the rapport building process that's going on with that, that a ways. Um, just, but just wanted to acknowledge that, yeah, we've identified the barriers of why he's still out over that a ways, why he's still in this, in this direction and we've been making contact. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I, you know, and appreciate the, uh, acknowledgement on the cleanup. I know our crew obviously goes out there, um, and we've actually had our safety department, um, and some of our sorters in masses come out um, twice or three times a day just to move um, these the drug use that's happening in front of our building, moving them along. So um, we do help out with the litter control. Um, so we appreciate the collaborative efforts. So thank you. There's no other questions. I don't know if um, maybe Liz or no Barbara. Question. Uh, no question, just the ongoing observation that, you know, we have month after month, week after week, year after year, that what's happening outside the front of PATH wasn't there before PATH took over. So you've got people who are congregating. You do have the drug dealing. It's on the sidewalks. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a bicycle theft ring. I don't know. But that accumulation of people hadn't been there before PATH took over that location. It continues to um, either remain the same or worsen. And that's the reason for your CUP having the challenges that it does. And what we keep asking you guys to do, Jonathan, is to fix that. And, I, you know, congratulations on all the wonderful things and the housing and all of that. And I continue, and I feel like a broken record to say what starts at PATH radiates out through our communities. And I'd like to see you guys step up. I know you've got Odin. We've been watching Odin's you know, awesome work. There is more that you can do. And I think you guys just need to step up and do that. And I promise you, I do not like to get on these calls to keep insisting like a broken record saying the same thing, but it has to happen. Yeah, Natasha, I think part of the reason why we we share the information we share is trying to paint a fuller picture of the homelessness crisis that I think our, our larger community is experiencing. You know, I, I know that the the area that PATH has been in has always been a place where there's been a larger concentration of people experiencing homelessness, even during the Casa Esperanza days. I know that to be a fact. So, you know, to contribute it just to PATH is not 100% accurate, but I think that there's a lot more going on that the county has really highlighted around the challenges of homelessness, which include the fact that people are becoming homeless at a faster rate that we can permanently house people right now. So that speaks to a larger economic challenge that we're having within Santa Barbara around the housing challenges. In addition to that, we're in, a, in the midst of an opioid crisis, you know, and, and the opioid crisis is something that homeless service providers do not create and have not, you know, exacerbated the issue. And we have a lot of drug dealers right now who are coming in who are who are preying upon people experiencing homelessness that are making this challenge worse for our community. You know, I mean, a lot of our clients, you may or may not be aware of this. Some of our clients are aware of what fentanyl is, but a lot of them don't. And so a lot of them are actually being poisoned. They're, they're, they think that they're taking one thing, but it's laced with another. And so it's contributing to the challenges that our community and our business partners are seeing. So I think that it is certainly challenging. I think that that we are all doing the best job that we can do, but it's a little bit more complex than that. And we're willing to step up to it, but we wanna make sure 
that our business partners have the information that they need to re recognize the complexity of it so you can be allies with, the, with us to advocate for more resources. So with all due respect, I think some of the ways that you are advocating for resources is contributing to our problems. And some of the ways that you're funded contributes to our problems. I think we can do a better job. And that's what I'm asking you to step up to. I want to add to it's it's unfortunate to to have to say, but we we are seeing open drug use, drug sales activity in other areas of the city. Um, it's not just in front of path. Um, and so our police department, our providers, the communication, honestly, business owners that have captured video and photos, and Susie knows this. I mean, we've been able to facilitate arrests, citations, share that with our narcotics team. Um, and and I think for all of us, the exhaustion is that we can't you know, facilitate that more than we already have. Um, and we keep prioritizing that region. I mean, you'll see the community action team is there and they say every single time they're present, they're writing multiple citations. Um, so please know that we have not let up on the prioritization of that region when it comes to public safety, um, as well as drug use and activity. And so we, we have a couple of, I would say a few really impacted regions when it comes to, to substance abuse um, that we're again, fully focused on, on doing everything we can to, to really address it. But Jonathan's correct. And so it's, I just want to emphasize it's not just in front of PATH. We have multiple areas throughout the city that we're seeing this. Um, it's increasing over time. Drug use of substance abuse is increasing over time. The number of overdoses are increasing. Um, and we're trying to do everything we can to, to get a handle on it um, and, and keep our city safe, as well as those who are um, being um, preyed on and, again, fall into addiction are getting the treatment they need as well. This is, this is, beyond any one agency's capacity to handle, and it is all, all of us working together to try to manage it as best we can. We had a conversation uh, just, I think, last week with a hotel manager down in the waterfront region who was saying, I know that the numbers of people experiencing homelessness decreased this last year, according to the point in time count, but uh, it doesn't it doesn't appear that way because we see that the substance abuse or the mental health concerns um, seem to be uh, more pronounced, especially among the individuals who already were dealing with some of these issues to begin with. So we are in the middle, in the midst of uh, heightened challenges with some individuals, even though we have less individuals in total, um, we, the, the problem is more apparent or more visible because the people who are struggling are struggling more than they ever were. Um, so we, as an Act on Homelessness Collaborative, are working with the city to try and figure out how can we, how can we deal with the behavioral health crisis we have in front of us. Um, also, knowing that we have staffing shortages countywide across behavioral health concerns um, or behavioral health disciplines, and so this is a big, this is a big ongoing issue. Other thoughts or questions for Jonathan? It's sad that, you know, growing up, we we had these programs like Mothers Against Drunk Drivers and Say No to Drugs, right? And our red ribbon campaigns and a lot of these programs, uh, I don't see or hear about them anymore. And so thank you, Barbara, for addressing, you know, we're seeing an increase and I understand it's in the schools and you know, there's no sharing of lunches anymore, swapping, you know, your tuna sandwich for a ham sandwich because it could be laced with something. So it's definitely become a, a different environment. We just got to be strategic and come together as a village on, on how to combat this because it's definitely out of control. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And it's hard we to have, come to work watching it, you know. Yeah, we have teenagers using during the day in our parking lots. I mean, this, this is... Like nothing we've ever seen before, the level, the use, um, the high acute. I mean, and like Jonathan saying that now fentanyl is being laced. I mean, like it's literally moving quicker than we are able to adapt to it. I mean, it's 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 pretty wild. 
Um, so I just, again, I appreciate the conversation and I, and I just really want to lift up path in terms of what you've been able to do, the successes you've been able to facilitate, even just in the last month and beyond um, for individuals experiencing homelessness, especially chronic homelessness, and how much time that takes to, to facilitate those transitions to get them the care and, and the housing that they need. Um, this The opioid epidemic is part of, but separate from that as well. So, I mean, we have to, we have to appreciate, I think Landon is mentioning the conversations we had that we need really to engage many more providers um, in this work on these calls um, to really get to the heart of the needs that we're seeing um, and the high acuity of needs that we're seeing across the city. There's no other questions uh, specifically for Jonathan at this time. I want to open it up just for general community concerns to be shared from anyone from the east side. So when we were talking about the um, the, the uh, people in, 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 in cars, it does seem that there's an increase in the number of people uh, living out of cars in the Dwight Murphy uh, park area. Um, there, there has been a uh, Dodge Caravan that was there for a couple of weeks. I noticed that that, that has uh, kind of moved on, uh, but there are a number of sedans uh, that have windows covered with uh, various types of reflective materials uh, and an RV that uh, kind of makes its way to the what would be the, the north west corner of the uh, Dwight Murphy parking lot seems to like that uh, that corner spot uh, quite a bit, um, but I, I'm 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 not sure. Uh, and then in, in addition to that, there's a, a large congregation of people that seem to uh, organize around the what would be the northeast corner of the uh, the building, the restrooms uh, that are there. Um, and then, yeah links to people that are on the railroad right of way across the street where there's a, a, a portable toilet uh, that's that's kind of been stationed there. Um, but my, my biggest concern is in that area is just people on the railroad tracks uh, as well as moving back and forth uh, kind of uh, at will across the street uh, and cars moving through that area, especially around that turn where people are not always paying attention. I'm, and I'm mostly worried about the safety of those people that are occupying that area. Yes, Rich, good morning. Um, this week, we really focused on that area. Melissa and Odin, we were there earlier this week and we were able to house two individuals that were staying there. I also talked to um, Officer Potter who's doing the UP cleanup, and I have, um, he's going to be concentrating on that area, on your the whole Ninos area, that whole railroad area. They're going to, I ask them to really focus on that area. That's where we've seen a large, uh, a large uh, encampments, uh, especially on the creek. So they're going to be focusing on that area. And Odin and I will continue to be focusing on uh, Ninos Drive in regards to the parking, I know um, the city's parking is working on doing signage for that area. So we'll keep you updated. They are working hard on that. Also, I do, I do want to say that um, we do go out with Odin and we sometimes see Jal out there. And we actually, two of my coworkers met up with them on Tuesday, I believe, and they did take one to rescue mission and one to pass. We have gone and done outreach out there and the area you're speaking about with the bathrooms. Um, we've done outreach there. We have told them to um, that they need to move out of there because it's not a place for them to be sleeping. Um, we've offered shelter, they declined it. Um, and so we are actively going out there. We do it on a weekly basis, right Odin? And uh, it's part of our Spanish outreach with um, PATH. Um, so we do check that area quite regularly. Uh, the people in the cars yesterday, I was out there myself with um, two of my coworkers of the PLHA team was out there. We did connect with one person that um, actually was in Montecito area. 
and um, he was sleeping in a car. And his situation is we're waiting for city housing authority to open up the vouchers again because his situation was we're at the point where he's going to get issued the voucher, but they're not issuing them right now. So right when he had his interview with them, they all of a sudden stopped issuing the vouchers. So we're waiting for that briefing to get his voucher and then he will be housed. So it's a situation like that. He does not want to go into shelter. Um, and previously he had rejected certain type of housing, like senior housing, and now he has accepted it. So now we're going to work to guide him that way. So when he does get the voucher, we have something in place for him, or at least leading to that. Um, then we do, um, I did hear from the UPRR this morning, because I was out in the Montecito area this morning with them. <clears throat> Their next area of focus is, like Joe said, the, the place from like the uh, bird refuge through like towards Milpa's area. That's the uh, next area they're going to focus on as well. So we um, uh, did take some advice from Joe the, the last week and we did check certain areas out there in the train tracks. Um, we just found just trash pretty much out there when we did outreach. Um, nobody was out there. So, I mean, we're trying, you know, um, and we do have our eyes on the Murphy field as well as, you know, the a space behind the duck pond and all that. Yeah, so so I, I really, I, I do appreciate all the efforts in that area. Um, like I said, one of my primary concerns is just the safety. We've had a number of individuals hit by uh, trains uh, in that area. Uh, so it's it just, a, you know, kind of a, most, a safety concern, but uh, we, we truly appreciate the people working in that area to try to address that. Uh, I, genuinely appreciate that that is not easy work uh so <laughs> thank you yeah thank you and i think we've mentioned it before the city has secured resources to start that renovation at dwight murphy field it's going to be some time but our focus is to get ahead of what individuals who could be displaced because of that um so it's it's going to be a huge undertaking for us to support folks in that transition. Um, and then we know the end result will be amazing, um, but we we need to make sure that we're, I think Liz, maybe a year out from that, we, we really want to make sure that we're getting ahead of what's to come in that regard. Thank you, Rich. Any other last comments or questions? Well, thank you again to all of you for being here with us today um, and for continuing to work forward with us. Um, this is just, it's just an ongoing conversation always. So we really appreciate all of you for being so consistent and showing up here. Um, we do intend to have our next neighborhood walk be on the east side. That'll be sometime in mid-June. So we're pinning down the time for that and then we will send out the invite. And we'd love for as many of you to come out as possible since you all are seeing the impact day to day. So that'll help us get eyes on the issues. But um, thank you again. Maybe we'll see you on Tuesday at noon for the all call meeting. Um, and if not, have a great weekend, everyone. And service providers, if you want to stick around, we have a few more minutes to do a check in. Just going to pause the recording.